All right. I would like to call this uh, January 28th meeting of the Mayor and Council to order. Um, I'm going to take just a minute to introduce uh, a couple of folks. As you all have noticed, we have started inviting someone to give the invocation and to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So tonight we're going to welcome the Reverend Whit Martin, uh, who is the pastor at the uh, Villarica First Methodist Church. Uh, he's a native of Gainesville, Georgia, and he's served Methodist churches across North Georgia for the past 15 years. Uh, his wife of 13 years um, just celebrated their 18th, her 18th year of teaching in special education. They have two daughters. They're excited to be a part of the Villarica community. Reverend Martin is in the final stretch of his Doctor of Ministry degree at Indiana Wesleyan University and is looking forward to finishing so that he can return to the woods to turkey and quail hunt. A little bit. So he will lead us in the uh, invocation, and then following that, I would ask you to remain standing. Uh, we're going to have Troop 1828, uh, which started at the Concord United Methodist Church. Uh, they take their unit number from the church's founding in 1828. Uh, the troop has had four Eagle Scouts, and it's going to be uh, Christian. And three other Scouts are currently uh, life-ranking and working on their Eagle Service Project in hopes of becoming an Eagle Scout soon. So if you would rise for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us bow. Almighty God, we thank you for this great city and for all of its elected officials. We ask that uh, as the business of this city comes together tonight, Lord, that you would grant wisdom and discernment. We are privileged to do the things that we do. And so, God, we ask that you would help all of us to do right by you and by the good people that we have the chance to serve here. We thank you for this night, and we thank you for an opportunity to be good stewards pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, boys, if y'all would come forward. Just, just me tonight, guys. So, uh, all right. Uh, please salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, he did part of my job. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Thank uh, Reverend Witt and uh, Christian for being here tonight. Um, let's see. Next thing we want to do is we want to ask, and her name's not on here. Yvette uh, from the West Georgia Regional Library staff, is that correct, will be coming to do a 2020 census presentation for us. Good evening. It's all right. We're going to wait. Jim's here. There we go. As we all know, the 2020 census is right around the corner. It begins on April the 1st, and the library is usually the closest organization to most of those that are hard to reach. 90% um, of those that are not normally counted are close to a library, so the census is partnering with libraries this year. And West Georgia Regional Library is trying to do a big event, especially um, as we go into the 2020 census season. Um, libraries service everyone from itty bitty to not so itty bitty and seasoned. Um, we are currently reaching out to the Villarica Elementary Schools because our hardest to reach and hardest to count are the little ones. People forget that you have to count the babies. They say, well, they don't have a job. I don't need to count them. Yes, we do. So we're reaching out to Villarica Elementary, Ithaca, um, all the daycares in the Villarica area, and those that are serviced by all of our libraries. And we are trying to partner with Tanner as well. So as soon as they are born, 
as of March 15th on, we want to count them as Villarica citizens. The library is going to participate and remind people through story times, through crafts, through a lot of different activities that you can bring your babies to, your grandbabies to, your teenagers to. Bring them to story time to be reminded that they need to be participating in the census. And not only will we have the activities that will remind you about the census, we will also have computers because this is the first year that the census will be computerized. So you can go onto our computers. Every single one will be able to access the census. And you can use them. We'll have four. That, that's the only thing they're going to do. But if you come to the library and you don't have your library card, it's OK. You can still do the census. If you do have your library card, you can still do the census. <laughs> if you don't have your library card, you need to get a library card. <laughs> so I expect to see you before the census. And we just want to know that everyone is welcome at the library. That's why we're partnering, because we want everybody to be counted. And we're going to have a census festival on April the 1st from 9 a.m. until about 6.30ish, because we got to close. Mm -hmm. We want you to come and fill out the census. If you don't fill it out at home, come and play with us. We will have giveaways. We'll have a few little snacks. While supplies last, so you need to get in early. And we want to make sure that you know that everybody counts. So even if we miss you on the 1st, We'll be doing it again that Saturday, the 4th. So just remember 44, 4144. Come visit the library. And that is all. Thank you. All right. <laughs> that was a quick presentation, but let's keep in mind how important the census is for us. We do this once uh, every 10 years, as mandated by the Constitution, but the census plays a huge role, and we'll be doing a five-part sort of series over the next uh, several weeks. We'll do some radio stuff. We'll do some uh, other things to try to, obviously, at the library with Yvette, to try to make you all aware of how important the census is. Uh, it's not just about counting, but the counting is the main part of it, but it's how funding gets allocated in a number of ways all across the state. So we'll talk more about that uh, in the coming weeks, and hopefully... Uh, we can get everybody counted here. Um, the next thing we want to move to is the adoption of the agenda. Do I s hear any uh, amendments to the agenda? I have two items that we need to add to the agenda. Actually, two changes. The first one is um, after council updates, I want to add approval of the consent agenda. The second one is item A2. I want to table that to the February 11th, the next meeting. <coughs> Those are the three changes to the agenda. Okay. Uh, A2, approval of expenditures. Number two, you would like to table that. Okay. So do I hear a motion uh, to amend the agenda by adding the approval of the consent agenda after council updates and tabling item number A2, approval of expenditures? Second. Uh, do I hear a motion? So what? Danny or? Okay. All right. So we got a motion and a Second. Second. All in favor? All right, we have an agenda. I'm sorry, I thought Danny did move already. My bad. I apologize. So <laughs> we are at the public comments portion of the meeting. Uh, we ask that you sign in for public comments. Uh, please state your name and address for the record and limit your comments to three minutes. I think we have a timer going. Anybody? Uh, I should uh, mention that in our audience, we have uh, the Carroll County Chairperson, Ms. Michelle Morgan. This is her stepping up now, and we also have in the audience, Clint Chance. He may or may not step up. I'm not sure. Okay. Michelle Morgan, 166 Winbrook Drive, Carrollton, Georgia. And I'm just here to congratulate and welcome uh, Michael and Gil to joining us as elected officials. Um, I was here a couple months ago. Um, I had brought umbrellas because, well, each of us have our own identities, um, like the We Are VR and um, Morgan Oil has theirs. We also are all one member of Carroll County. So my little saying goes, I'm committed to working together to make all of Carroll County great. 
No relationship is all sunshine. We're very happy to have the sunshine today. But we can share one umbrella and succeed together, and really quickly it's paid for by my money, not by taxpayers. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Awesome. I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, next. Hello, I've already signed in. My name is Latanya Smith, uh, 2514 Sonoma Valley here in Villa Rica. Uh, in November, I came to share with you all, I started a nonprofit called Speak Life to Youth and Children, Slick International. And we have been up and going for now four months, um, starting literacy classes here at the Villa Rica Library, thanks to Miss Yvette, who's been very gracious in helping us, and we recently started um, in Douglas County Library, Purpose, Passion, and Career. They help kids decide on what they want to do prior to the age of 18. So we're having speakers come out. This Saturday, we're having a photographer. Um, is his passion not his job yet? He's working on it. So I was coming to give cards, because the last time my cards had not arrived in the mail, and I'm going to pass those out. And to let you all know we're here to stay, we're here to make a difference. Um, each class is growing more and more. If you check out our website, we started out in November with eight kids, went up to 12 kids December, and we had 14 or 15 kids. I can't even remember. Um, uh, we also have community partners. Publix actually sponsored the um, snacks for that event on this past Saturday, as well as Wells Fargo. Um, uh, branch manager actually taught the class to the kids on this past Saturday. So we have Darius Bailey and Associates who's partnering with us, as well as a couple of other people. So yes, we're going to need funding eventually, and we're working on that. But we need bodies who want to volunteer and help make a difference in a child's life. It goes across racial, economic, social. I'm here to help kids and pour into them. So whatever. I can do to do, make a difference. That's what Slick is here for. So I just want to introduce myself again. And you'll be seeing me once or twice every two months. And I'll just come and stick my head in and, so y'all can get from me in face. But I want to thank you, especially the Villa Rica Library, because this past Saturday I got a couple of blessings from being there today. And Miss Yvette is wonderful. So just letting y'all know that. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Vicki Foster. I'm at 131 Maple Valley. And I'm here just to express a concern uh, with Edge Road at the pilot. Um, there's the semi trucks parking there. Uh, the other day it was raining. Uh, I was coming over that hill and there was trucks out in the road and I had to go around them. And there was another car coming at me and we almost had a head on collision. Uh, Another safety issue, if you're trying to pull out of the pilot and take a left, um, you can't see because there's so many semis parking there. Uh, I went into the pilot, talked to them. They said they can't do anything. It's not their property. That's Villarica's property. I called the police. They said there's nothing they could do. They told me to come here and talk to you. What I'd like to do is get signs put up along that area saying no parking for trucks. So I'm here to find out what I can do. So we don't typically respond during public comments, so please, I, I just didn't want to okay. leave you hanging over there. Uh, but what will happen is we will have the city manager, and, and I know that this is being looked at. I can just, I'll say that just okay. briefly, uh, but just not to get into a back and forth. But the city manager uh, will, will take a look at this and get back in touch with you. We have your number. Yes. Name. Okay. I'm here. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Next. Larry Kors, 115 Maple Valley Drive, Villa Rica, Georgia. I will also reiterate that Edge Road at the interstate at Pilot Truck Stop at uh, Liberty is a big disaster. You have multiple trucks going down Edge Road and they try to turn around wherever, whenever they can in whoever's property that they want to. Unfortunately, it usually ends up making a real mess. Now, I'm not picking on you, Danny, but thank goodness they haven't backed down to your, your driveway yet. They've, they, they've tried everybody else's driveway and, and they got usually get stuck and we see all their wheel ruts. Uh, today, they made it all the way down to the end of uh, Edge Road. No, 
yes, down, down the end of Edge to uh, be on Daniel, and the police department met him at about 11 o'clock this morning. And they managed to turn the truck around and get him back up to the truck stop. My suggestion would be that we try a better signage, like A, no parking, and B, uh, try increasing uh, the signage on Edge Road, no trucks, no inches to truck stop this road, no parking, no truck parking either side of the road, and replace the pilot truck entrance sign, which is woefully, it's a nice big sign. What it accommodates is a white background and an arrow. What it does not accommodate is words. Your words are too small. It was a good, a I give you an A for effort for trying to put the sign up and get us to move and, and try to get their attention. That the truck, the truck entrance is this way to the truck stop. But you almost, with these guys, you almost need a flashing sign that says, beep, 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 here it is. You know, with a dancing girl out there on the, on the pole saying, it's this way, guys, it's this way, guys, come on. Having been in the trucking industry, you smirk at me, but having been in the trucking industry and dealt with them as an auditor for 20 years, I know what I'm saying. You really need to deal with them on their level. Put the signage up, tell them what it is. They don't. Ticket them, tow them. Thank you. We're not smirking, Larry. We know that's probably true. That's my All right, anybody else? All right, we will close the public comments portion of the meeting. And let's move on to council updates. Anybody? Okay, then I have one. I mean, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, boards and commissions. As you all, if you get the newsletter, you've noticed that I've been highlighting uh, the vacancies on the boards and commissions. Uh, in that newsletter, if you don't get it, please email the city clerk, A. Doyle at Villarica.org, and she will get you on the list and make sure that gets out to you. Uh, we currently have four vacancies on the Recreation Advisory Committee. We have one on the Cemetery Committee uh, and one on Main Street. That's exactly right. So I wanted to highlight that. Let's make sure that if you are able to serve on one of these boards that you would put in an application also with the City Clerk. Uh, she receives all of the applications and then distribute, distributes them to the staff person in charge uh, of those boards. Uh, the second thing I'd like to do is invite uh, Ms. Janet Chumley up, who is our Main Street Manager. I'd like her to talk for just a moment about a project that she's working on uh, that I think is uh, interesting for the City of Villarica. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So there's a show on HGTV, I don't know if you guys watch it, it's called Hometown. And it's a man and wife that go in and renovate their hometown of Laurel, Mississippi. So HGTV, in conjunction with Ben and um, Aaron, are going to do a six-part series called Hometown Makeover. And if we get chosen, the city of Villarica, um, it would be a six-part series that they would start filming in 2021. And the goal for them is to help cities with populations of 40,000 and under kind of revitalize some of the areas in need. So one of the things we're going to do in part with the video is shoot a clip at the Mill Amphitheater Monday, February the 3rd at 2 p.m. And we're going to shoot a clip, whether it says welcome to Villarica HGTV or something, and we'll add that tidbit onto the promotional video that we will submit February the 7th to them. Keep our fingers crossed. But I'm excited about this project. It's really cool. Are you asking anyone to show up for that? Yes. Anybody in the community, you're welcome to show up, come out, support Villarica get in the video you might be famous one day we don't know but it's worth a shot right give us the date and time again yes okay. uh, Monday February the 3rd at the Mill Amphitheater 106 Temple Street at 2 p.m. it's not gonna rain that day we're gonna have sunshine so it'll be a pretty day to come out and shoot this clip and we're excited to do that all right thank you Jan. thank y'all appreciate that okay um, so now we're gonna move on to approval of the consent agenda so let me take a minute those of you who are following along with the agenda, uh, I'm going to go through and name off uh, some items that we have uh, decided to move to the consent agenda, and then I'll ask someone to make that motion, and we'll 
move forward. So on the consent agenda would be item C1, vendor recommendation for the senior delivery vehicle. Item C2, vendor recommendation for athletic staff. Item D1, surplus C900 pipe. Uh, item uh, D2, surplus three fleet vehicles. D3, surplus old tire balancer. D4, Civic Center renovation, and E1, Equipment Storage Building for the Distribution and Collection Department. Do I hear a motion to adopt that consent agenda? I move to adopt the consent second. agenda as outlined. Second. Thank you. Can I get a second? I second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. All right, now let's move on to the approval. Uh, Yes, sir. Before we move on, uh, just so that we can be sure that the minutes reflect accurately what the council just did, you did adopt the consent agenda. I just want to confirm with the council that that constitutes an approval of the items that were on the consent agenda. So uh, I think it's fine tonight with, with that your understanding that that's what we did. In the future, the motions probably ought to say that we are adopting and approving all the items on the consent agenda. I appreciate that. And we'll clean it up. For those of you who don't know, this today was the first time we did a work session and consent agenda in probably a year and a half. So we're going to have a few little uh, hang-ups that we need to clean up. The uh, next item under the governing body is the approval of the minutes, uh, the meeting minutes of January the 9th, 2020. You all have had an opportunity to review those. Do I hear a motion to amend or approve? I make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of January 9th, 2020. Do second. I hear a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the, uh, the minutes of January the 9th, 2020. All in favor? All right. We have tabled item A2. So now we're going to move to item uh, B1, Community Development, RA0919, rezoning request of 100 Hickory Level Road, Popeyes, Ron Johnson. You have the floor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, tonight we have application RA-09-19, Popeyes, Louisiana Kitchen. Um, the applicant is applying for a rezoning for a council-imposed condition, uh, two council-imposed conditions. Um, to be lifted for a um, tract for the Popeye's restaurant, specifically located at 100 Hickory Level Road. Uh, the current parcel number is 1680190, but for the purposes of tonight, um, I'll be referring to survey uh, dated July 1st, 2019, um, entitled Boundary slash Topographic Survey by Lowry and Associates. The original uh, development application was approved on August 6, uh, 2019 by the Planning Commission and August 27, 2019 by the City Council for a Popeye's um, restaurant on the northeast, or excuse me, on the uh, southwest corner of Hickory Level Road and Highway 61 um, as a part of Annex-01-19 slash uh, RA-05-19. Uh, the Planning Commission and City Council at that time uh, imposed a condition to have interparcel and intraparcel connectivity of the 50-acre um, site along with sidewalks. Uh, the applicant has cited that engineering complications because of topographic conditions of the site uh, makes it unfeasible for the condition to be adequately satisfied. Uh, the applicant is requesting relief of this condition on the 0.922 acre um, Popeyes, specifically the Popeyes site, um, in order to move forward with the development. Um, the application was approved with conditions as outlined in the staff report by the Planning Commission um, 3 to 0 on January 7th, uh, 2020. And um, in the staff report, you'll see that um, adequate public parking uh, for the Popeyes has been met by the UDC standard. 17 parking spaces are required and 31 spaces have been supplied. Uh, the applicant has prepared an exhibit showing the relation um, of the colonial pipeline in relation to the Popeye site and the rest of the 50 acres as well. And the applicant is here <laughs> to go over that information. Okay. Um, 
Do we have any questions for staff? All right, David, this is going to require a public hearing. Do we want to hear from the applicant first? Yes, generally you're going to hear from the applicant and then ask for the public hearing. All right, so would the applicant come forward? Good evening. Uh, my name is Connor Patton. I'm with Foresight Group. Sorry, I thought that might adjust more. Um, I'm the I work with the civil engineering firm Foresight Group, who is designing the site for just for the Popeyes. So we're only looking at that 0.92 acres you see in orange on the exhibit, um, representing the developer and now owner of the 0.92 acres uh, who plans to develop the Popeyes at CSE Properties. Uh, so we're here today to discuss only the 0.92 acres. Uh, it was annexed, obviously, and rezoned back in August of 2019. Uh, the entirety of the 50 acres and we're looking at um, adjusting the five stipulations that were placed on the property uh, for just our 0.92 acres so uh, back in august we didn't have our full topographic survey back and we had not completed our civil engineering design uh, so we were unaware of um, the you know hardships at that time uh, the existing site has approximately 20 feet of grade change between the top of the property kind of at the northeast corner uh, on the site and hickory level road so there's 20 feet of grade change between those two points uh, you know, we've, we've designed the Popeye site to cut into that hill and as, as necessary to uh, connect the driveway on Hickory Level Road. Uh, we, we've lined it up uh, directly across from the um, car dealership, so, uh, you know, so that would work engineering-wise. And, um, you know, and we lowered as much as we could in, in order to connect that driveway at a reasonable grade while also not impacting the Colonial Pipeline that is directly to our south, as you see in the yellow on our exhibit, uh, you know, just, just over our southern property line for that 0.92 acres. Uh, you know, the existing topography on the site and existing uh, colonial pipelines severely limit the, connect, the ability to connect pedestrian and uh, vehicular access to the remaining 49 acres. Um, so we're here today to ask that you would uh, remove those two stipulations, as Ron discussed, uh, for our 0.92 acre site. All right. Uh, I appreciate that. Do you have any questions from council? This, this is an item that's come back to the council from back in August, so they are familiar with it. Mm -hmm. I just wanted them, we can probably cut to the chase if anybody has any questions here. I think you've clarified one point that came up. This is only affecting the point nine two yes, uh, out of the 50. So that was, a, I know, a concern that was raised with me. So does anybody on the council have any questions for the applicant? OK, thank you. Sir. Can I make one Would final point? Absolutely. Um, at, about the Planning Commission meeting back in, uh, on January 7th, um, it was discussed the, the option of possibly having stairs connect to the right of way, uh, but that would not comply with our ADA, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. They have requirements on ramp links and, and slopes and, and such that we have to meet. So uh, having just a stairway down to the right of way uh, would not comply with that. So in order to have the ramps that we would need in order to connect to the right of way, uh, it would take about 300 feet, which is a you know, football field length of, of ramp to connect those points. So I just wanted to add that in there. I appreciate thank you, you very much. That. I, I was familiar with that. I'm not sure if everybody was, but Perfect. thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, we will open this up for a public hearing. Uh, is there anyone uh, here tonight that would like to speak either for or against this zoning? John Mount, 214 Rock Mart Road. Um, <clears throat> so in that area and across the street, I, I actually dropped my truck off at the uh, Chevrolet place to get it serviced. And trying to walk to the Starbucks is basically dangerous. The state highway has crossings, but there's no sidewalks in anywhere up in that area. So hopefully they will at least put the sidewalks along the state route and along Hickory Road so there's access to... Um, be able to walk up there and and not get ran over having to walk down the side of the state highway or down in the ditch on the other side that's filled with kudzu and the whole I mean, it's very uh, pedestrian unfriendly in that whole section of town over there all right thank you anyone else <coughs> larry Corris, 115 maple valley drive villa rica i too disagree with the uh, waiver of the uh, sidewalks uh, for the uh, Hickory level and State Route 61 access points. We're trying to make ourselves a, a pedestrian, more, more pedestrian friendly community whereby we're trying to have walking trails and this would be one of the areas we'd want to access as one of the retail points 
on our future looking outlook on our walking trails. You're also going to, the, the, the reason why the, the applicant is making an objection is because I was the one who made the point about the sidewalks in the interconnecting area at the planning zoning meeting and that's where the objection came from. And I probably slight amendment on his part on his application and waiver. So the waiver it is, is correct, should not apply to the, the balance of the acres, the other 49 acres. The, uh, the issue came up about lowering his property approximately 20 feet. What was he gonna do with the dirt? Well, there's plenty of people love to have his dirt and probably be glad to buy it from him. The hauling is, is the hard part and it's time consuming and expensive. <coughs> So that gets us down to, all right, do we really have to have a uh, walkway of any type, whether it's steps or whether it's a ramp? I'm not, com not complacent at all in, uh, in uh, ADA, so I, I defer. But if he's not willing to, if the applicant is not willing to try to help all aspects of the public, then why should we give the waiver? He should be willing to meet all of the aspects of the public, all the demands of the public. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to come up, you know, that the handicapped are going to come up in droves and want to come to his place of business, but he has to be given to be able to give them the opportunity. If the opportunity is that the ramp goes down or the access to the sidewalk is at the back end of the property of the driveway, that's where it should be. Because we know it's going to have to be able to meet grade because it's a driveway, which leads to the next objection. What are we going to do about the left-hand turn off a of Hickory Level Road and the backing up of traffic out onto State Route 61? I only have to direct you down to uh, 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 down down to our favorite uh, 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 chicken sandwich facility and find that we're going to have all the backed-up traffic at Chick-fil-A coming back out onto the back out on 61 and backed up on Common Drive. Now, if we're not going to have a, a, a frontage road as a blessing to us at Chick-fil-A, we definitely don't have it up here at, at Popeye's on a very, a very busy intersection. That's only going to get busier. And I think we need to readdress that. And I must, I must stand in opposition. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, anybody else? Jody Mount, 214 Rockmart Road. Um, I too am really concerned about not having any kind of sidewalks. It just doesn't make any sense. As Larry had said, we are trying to become a more pedestrian friendly community, um, which is going to be in part important if we do want to attract young people to make their homes here in Villarica. And there are a lot of us seniors that walk and, and like to not just go out and walk, like to walk to do their errands, walk to go out to eat and do things like that. Um, I'm also concerned about safety issues. I already see a lot of pedestrian traffic on Hickory level. Um, and then, I mean, you, you're not, I know people from the Chevrolet place are going to want to walk over and go eat at Popeye. So I, I don't understand. Do they just have to go in the driveway? Um, I, 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 I don't understand. And I'm not an engineer. I don't understand that part. Um, but sidewalks, I, it just isn't making sense to me. And it's not fitting in with our plans for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? OK, let's close the public hearing portion. Uh, let's bring staff back up. Uh, Ron, would you address? Uh, the sidewalk issue uh, from the city's standpoint? Uh, yes, so um, what the city engineer um, reviewed um, preliminary plans, um, including to, uh, topography of the site, and our development code currently requires for sidewalks to be installed um, for all commercial developments. Um, that's something that has been pretty consistent here in Villarica. Um, the, um, being that there's, um, and, and I'm speaking specifically to the um, interparcel connectivity as well, um, being that there's a, 
a major drop off and change in grade and there's a, a lack of ability to get ramps, there would be multiple switches to go back and forth on ramps to um, get all the way down. Um, and that is something that uh, was deemed engineering. Um, and engineering wise, a very large difficulty for someone to, uh, to overcome any applicant. Um, no matter what type of store, no matter how much traffic, um, foot traffic that they may or may not have. Um, this is a primarily auto-dominated use. Um, it has a drive-through. It has multiple parking spaces, way more than what our ordinance requires. Um, and um, as far as um, putting in sidewalks that would not connect to the site, I mean, if we're just going to, uh, and I'm speaking to Hickory Level Road, that would uh, sort of defeat the purpose of getting to the Popeye's restaurant. Uh, the Georgia Highway 61 GDOT would have control over um, and jurisdiction over that as well for sidewalks. Okay, so, and I'm going to open this up to questions in just a moment uh, for both staff and for the applicant, but my understanding is, and I wasn't on the council when this was passed, but that had you known about this topography issue then, you would not have had these conditions because it was such a, a hardship. Is that, is that fair? Um, I, would, I would actually have to defer to Bobby on that one. Because the way I understand it, you're talking about many, many layers Absolutely. and feet to even get down to this level from the, from the street. Mayor, members of council, Bobby Elliott, city engineer. Um, when these conditions were placed on this site, as Connor stated, the he only had some preliminary topo on the on the site, uh, based on the, the final topography on it and the preliminary design. The with those two conditions placed on this property, the Popeyes cannot develop it. It's impossible engineering-wise because of the gas line that's in there. They, yes, they can lower that, but they can't lower it but just so much because that gas line has got, they got strict restrictions on how much cover you got to maintain on that. So, number one, they couldn't lower the site to be more friendly with Hickory Level to get ADA accessibility sidewalk-wise up into the site. So based on the elevation that they're stuck with on the development, you, you can't, ADA requirements on sidewalk slope is a 2% slope. And to get that slope coming off Hickory level, you'd have to have about four or five switchbacks. And you know what a switchback is. You go up, you go up, you go up to, to make it legal. In other words, we can't approve that unless it's got that slope on it. And that's, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen one on a fast food restaurant or any other commercial restaurant or any, or any other commercial project. So based on those two conditions, they can't develop the site. That's where we're, that's where we're sitting. Okay, thank you. Let me open this up to some council discussion. Does anybody have any questions for yeah. staff or uh, the applicant? For Go ahead. How high is the site? Above Hickory Level Road, is it 20 feet? 20 feet, 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 feet is it? Yeah, it's 8 to 10 feet above Hickory Level to the, the uh, parking lot surface. It's 8 feet. There's no way to put a sidewalk from Hickory Level or any of that? Well, you can put a sidewalk in, but they won't be ADA legal. He's talking about the grade. Would, yeah. I'm talking about your, your, you can get a sidewalk in. I mean, we can do anything, but the grade is the issue to meet ADA compliance. That is correct, That's yes. what we're talking about. For a public sidewalk to be installed on public right-of-way, you have to meet ADA compliance. And, and those don't, that doesn't include stairs. Councilman. Look, looking at the uh, driveway entrance and the topographical lines here, that's pretty steep just for cars. It's, eight uh, foot, it's an eight-foot grade change. And in a short distance for, yes. for the drive-up. Yeah. People are going to try and walk up that. Is there any concern or any any legal obligation we have to make accommodations for people that try and walk up a driveway? I wouldn't think so, other than just a, it's a public driveway. I mean, um, it's not going it's to be not, not meant for pedestrian traffic. That's so. correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I guess, Bobby, my only question is, so does the grade become an issue because uh, I guess I'm trying to figure out where, where the grade becomes an issue. If, I mean, is it possible to put sidewalks on the perimeter of the property so that way, but then I guess they'd be, they'd be uh, limited by the colonial pipeline easement though. Yes. Yeah. So, I don't know. I can see it, yeah. Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, um, I would uh, entertain a motion. get over to it <clears throat> I make a motion to approve the rezoning proposal made by Foresight Group with the three conditions as outlined by the City Council on August 6 2019 and the removal of two conditions for interparcel and intraparcel connectivity between the proposed Popeyes Louisiana kitchen restaurant and the remaining sections of the parcel that portion particularly being designated on the boundary and topo survey um, submitted by the applicant and I believe dated um, July 1st July 1st 2019 thank you Ron <clears throat> as well as removal of the condition to supply sidewalks on on and off-site in locations that pose engineering and or topographic challenges as reviewed and considered by the city of Illawarra engineer okay I have a motion to accept staff recommendation. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any additional discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Congratulations, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. All right, let's move on to uh, amendment to the Unified Development Code, B2. This will be Mr. Montesinos. You have the floor. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council and members of the public. Uh, what we have before us is a, an amendment to our current Unified Development Code to modify the public notification requirements in the ordinance as pertains to uh, city-initiated zoning actions. I'm uh, open to any, any questions you may have. Okay. Um, we did go over this just briefly. Uh, this is a, a zoning change, is that correct, David? It is. Uh, so we will need to have a public hearing on this as well. Let me open up uh, for uh, the questions from council first. Anybody have any questions? Do we need to set a the review process or anything like that in, in this motion, or is that already established? <coughs> as I'm, I'm not it, clear it, on the it, question. It, yeah. So, I, pardon me. I think that's two different questions. The, the one you're talking about is is mm -hmm. the up or down zoning, the automatic rezoning uh, of the 62 or 90 parcels, ever how many it was. What we're dealing with right now is the amendment to the Unified Development Code that would apply to all 6,600 and some odd right. parcels. So that's two different okay. subjects. This is a text amendment. So if there are no additional questions, let me open this up to um, the, the, the public hearing. Uh, anyone here wishing to speak for or against uh, this item, please come forward now. Okay, seeing no one coming forward, uh, it'll come back to the council for uh, a motion. I'd like a motion to approve a text amendment to section 2.01 sub B, the United Development code to read. I'm going to read this thing. Notification. No, zoning text amendments and revisions of the zoning map, which are initiated by the city, shall not require the posting of signs on affected properties. Notice of the property owner shall be required where the rezoning will substantially affect the enjoyment of, or use of the property as currently developed and shall not be based on projected of prospect financial gain on the property future transaction. The city shall be exempt from the notification of individual property owners adjoining the property being rezoned, but shall not be exempt from any requirements under the Georgia Zoning Procedures Law. Second. 
Okay, I have a motion. Uh, do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Is there any additional discussion? Okay. So, all in favor? Sounds good. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. If I could give you a brief update just uh, on the public notice uh, portion of the uh, zoning. We talked about the affected properties that we would be notifying by certified mail. Uh, as you mentioned, 93 of those properties were identified as being substantially modified. Uh, some of those were corrective actions and some of those, of those were proactive actions on the part of the government. Uh, we sent out uh, two weeks ago uh, 71 certified uh, uh, letters. Uh, since then, 68% uh, of those have actually been collected by the property owners, which is a, a pretty good return. Uh, of those 68%, we have been individually notified by 10 individuals representing 14 properties. And of those, uh, five of those 14 were in favor of what we were doing. Uh, there were another five uh, who objected. Two of those, we've already gone back and made corrective actions on the map based on the information we had. And so now we're down to three representing uh, five properties that will move forward once this is adopted and once we get to a position where we can hold a public hearing to decide the final transaction on those properties. Okay, that, that's good information. Okay. Appreciate that. All right. And if it, do you, any, does anybody have any additional questions for Chris? All Chris, right, thank you. Chris, well, just, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So do you have a, a guideline do you use to to note the substantial change, or how do you determine that? Yes, as uh, the mayor had mentioned, there were 6,667 properties in the city. Uh, if the zoning was going to go to a commercial to a commercial, just changing the vernacular of what it was called, if it was going from a PD to a PUD, that was considered a non consequential uh, transaction. If it was going from uh, industrial or commercial to agricultural, that would be a significant change. Uh, if it were going for, from industrial to residential, in a case of a corrective action, those would also, also be uh, notified as well. So only the, the, the ones that were nonlinear in, uh, in transaction were notified specifically. So out of six, 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 seven properties, 1.4% of the properties were actually notified. Okay. So your, your definition of substantive would be an up or down zoning. Correct. Okay. Would that be clear enough? Yeah, that's fine. I just also, I mean, was there any issue though where you had maybe a new zoning category that didn't permit the same uses as the old zoning category in the yes. switch? As a matter of fact, that actually came up in one circumstance on the objection side. Uh, there was a property that was uh, is currently zoned O and I. It was surrounded by uh, two churches and a real estate office. And if we zoned those two O and I under the new code, those two churches would be legally nonconforming. Okay. So what we did was we looked at an, uh, a sort of a, a similar uh, zoning district, which in this case was the C1 or light commercial, that would accommodate all those uses without creating a, a legally nonconforming situation. But in the notification process, though, did you factor the different per permitted uses and the different ordinances? Yes. Okay. Yes, we did. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, next up, we are going to have our CFO, Ms. Sarah Andrews, come forward and give us uh, our financial update. This would be for December 2019. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is our financial update for December 2019, and this means we are three months through our fiscal year of 2020. First up, this is our cash comparison from the same point, uh, December 31st of 2018 to December 31st of 2019. <coughs> our total cash, which includes a CD, has gone from 11.5 million to 16.6 million. Um, part of that is the general fund growth, 5.8 million to 7.5 million, and then our water and sewer fund, which we are now in our third round of rate increases in the last three years. You can see those rate increases have in, um, 
a few years ago we had negative cash and now we're at 3.5 million dollars in cash for our water sewer fund our sanitation fund is positive we did do um, an adjustment at the end of the last fiscal year i'm hoping that'll be the last time that we have to clear off a balance um, for that fund should be self-sustaining now which was our goal and then those last three are our current our splossed funds we have three separate splossed funds that we are spending from Next, this shows our building permits. This is new construction only. Uh, so in December of 2018, that fiscal year, we had 51 permits at that point so far. And in this fiscal year, so this is three months into the fiscal year, we have 62 permits so far and the taps that correspond with that. This is our water and sewer income statement. Again, comparing year to date 2018 to year to date 2019. And when I say year to date, I mean within the fiscal year. So that's three months worth. And again, this is, oh, that says two, but as of, well, as, I guess at that point we still only had two rate increases. Now in January, we've had our third. So um, you can see total revenue has grown with the two rate increases. Um, and I did want to point out on the right, you can see I've pointed out the debt in the debt expense has increased that was part of our big push with the financial health was getting ready for our almost half a million increase for our debt payment this year and we have done that this is our sanitation solid waste income statement so at this point last year again that's three months into our fiscal year last year our net income was four thousand dollars whereas this year we're showing twenty eight thousand dollars so we have finally made this fund self-sufficient just some other things to point out are sales tax, which we do get sales tax from Carroll County and Douglas County. We have seen an increase from last year on both of those. Water purchases, I wish I'd separated that a little bit. This isn't so much of a, um, a, a good thing necessarily. Um, our water purchases have increased from last year. However, this year we had the significant drought compared to the prior year. So in this fiscal year, we have purchased $161,000 of water so far. And in total employees, I just think it's good so everybody kind of has a general idea of how many employees we have. We are at 167 at the end of December. And last but not least, our self-funded insurance total since we started in October of 2017, we have saved almost $750,000. The orange box shows the contributions we put into the bank account for self-funded. So that is the contributions from the employees and the city. And then the blue box shows how much we've actually paid out. So by being self-funded, we only pay out the actual expenses uh, to the physicians for the prescriptions, and then we have some third-party administrative fees that we pay as well. So in three months, we've had a difference of $154,000 between what we have contributed compared to what we have actually paid out. Any questions? All right, thank you, Sarah. Any questions for Sarah? Talk about the lag. So we do have some lag. Um, I'm trying to think now how much it was. With this last, with the audit that's currently going on, uh, we had to book back over $100,000 of expenses that were incurred. So somebody went to the doctor or they had a prescription filled in the prior fiscal year, but it takes, it could take three to six months for it to actually be processed and us pay it. So then that total savings number I think um, Council Member Carter asked about it last time, what is the trend? And we had been steadily creeping up to $800,000 and then at the last meeting you saw it decrease. And that was because of the lag that was posted back to the prior fiscal year. So I only do that at audit time, so once a year we kind of make sure everything got into the correct fiscal year. Um, but then you'll see the month to month, um, every month that I'm showing you. So does this savings, does that reflect the lag? Yes. Okay. Okay. So we continue to save money on this self-funded in insurance. Correct. Piece. And in the last fiscal year, I pointed it out um, to the council when I sent that email. Uh, we did. We were able with our savings. We were able to either eliminate or reduce co-pays for the employees. Um, the council approved buying Fitbits for all the employees. Um, so we've had some good things. Even through the savings, we've um, we've been able to do some additional things. So and still show savings. Anybody else have any questions? I noticed that with the Fitbit program, we now looks like you all are about to start your first challenge. We are currently in our first challenge. You're in your first challenge. Yes, trying to get our most steps or most active minutes. All 
right. Well, good luck. I should have been doing this while I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have one of those, and I have my son wearing it. So oh. if, you don't notice, if you notice that I'm winning, <laughs> maybe I'm just kidding about that. All right. If there are no more questions, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. We continue to look pretty good here uh, financially, which is good. I see Chris running back to the podium. Chris has our last item uh, before we get to the city manager's report. Uh, this is a discussion only item and this is a continuation of the new Villarica zoning ordinance so Chris you have the floor yes this is the ongoing saga of the Villarica zoning ordinance uh, we have uh, received all of the feedback from the planning commissioners from the city council members from staff from the public and are prepared to finalize the final draft of the ordinance to be submitted to the council for review and uh, adoption. There are a number of uh, recommendations that were outlined in a list that was provided to the council, as well as was provided to the planning commission on January the 7th um, to let them know the things that they had contributed were uh, included in the draft ordinance and also to outline those items that were recommended either by staff as inclusions or by additional uh, comments from either city council or from the public. Um, so we started the initial uh, draft uh, review by the city council and the planning commission back in September of 2019 and got through a number of iterations to get to the point where we are today. So I wanted to provide an opportunity for the council to look over the um, inclusions uh, or the revisions or amendments as, as, as outlined uh, to see if there were any items that uh, were particularly trouble, troublesome to the council uh, before we uh, assemble the final draft of the ordinance. Okay, I've had a chance to review those uh, as well as everyone else and I know there's been some questions about it so uh, let me open this up to council anybody has any questions now no I'll probably have some input after I go through your email of yesterday to, to, to look at the, the most up-to-date redline version okay you did send that out just yesterday so uh, I think that it's been communicated to you not only uh, previously in this in, in this setting but through a number of emails and we followed up on that so I think we're headed in the right direction <coughs> Does anybody, any council member have any questions tonight? I do know that we got the red line version yesterday. We're going to want to go through that uh, one last time. Did you have something? Yeah. So what does the timeline look like to, you know, the actions each city council meeting until we get this approved? How does that well, lay out? Well, the, the timeline that we're on right now is that we have advertised and put public notice out for a public hearing on March the 10th. I wanted to give the public an opportunity to respond to the certified letters that we put out uh, as well as to to uh, wrap up this final document for review uh, by the City Council so um, I, I'm not sure what uh, vehicle you guys want to use to communicate your your thoughts on how this should be finalized or if we need to bring it back into a public forum to 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 uh, articulate that well, let, so I want to take that a little bit separately. David, I asked you at the last meeting to consider how we would handle objections and what we would do to ensure due process for our property owners. And I want to make sure that we have something in place for that before we finally adopt this. Do you have anything yet, or are you working with Chris on getting something? I think it was important to get some sort of an idea as to what the volume of it would be in I order to uh, set what the process is. I mean, from hearing Chris's st statistics, uh, it doesn't sound like there's going to be a huge volume of, of people complaining. So I think you could probably have a hearing night where you go through all of those. Now, that is separate and apart from the adoption of the the text of the new ordinance altogether yeah mm -hmm. but I want to make sure that that is is a part of, of, sure. of this process and and I do <coughs> understand that it does look like most of this will be an amicable workout but for those that are not we need to make sure that we right we'll uh, make sure they have process. the rights that's right um, 
So what do you propose in terms of whether or not we finalize all of this in a public hearing, uh, Chris's schedule that he just discussed? My, my thought initially is that for the amendment and the adoption of the text ordinance that Chris's proposal that you do it on March the 10th okay. works out fine. I don't think you have to do all of these individual uh, zoning amendments for the, pro the properties, the owners that have been no notified at that same time. I mean, I don't know what your plan has been on that. Well, I think the challenge there is that when you're adopting new zoning classifications and you're zoning map does not reflect the new classifications then it creates a disconnect right what i would recommend that we do is use the public hearing uh on march the 10th is the first reading for the document and at that meeting then once we have a a, a pretty uh solid number of of ob objectors yes. then we can say we're going to set up a public hearing on uh, the first meeting in, in April, for example, to hear those uh, cases. Otherwise, they're going to be neutrally zoned until otherwise amended. Yeah, that that seems, sounds like a very reasonable schedule. Uh, I just think it's important for us to know if you're going to have 100 objectors, then we need to set forth more time than just a meeting. If there's I five. You, won't, you don't have a full understanding of that yet. There's no way because no. We, we, we haven't right. had the time. So maybe you could propose uh, some type of schedule uh, for us by the next council meeting, uh, because that's plenty of time before the March 10th yes. date. I'll, I'll put together an email to notify you. I don't think there's anything uh, that I need to be on the agenda for at this okay. point. Uh, but I did want to get clarification on the list of items. Um, if you will, um, as a group, yes, individually no. let me know if you have objections so that I can finalize the draft to get the uh, red lines out, Oops, excuse me, to get all the, uh, the red lines out and so that we can start uh, adjusting the format and the pagination of the final document. So That's that interesting. I've never seen that uh, before. So what you're essentially asking is individually for the council members to communicate back to you a consensus by whether or not they're a yes or a no on this particular item. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting way to put it. I guess the context that I was thinking of was in the context of how I received the feedback initially <laughs> from the council. Um, and I, as I mentioned in the agenda, I wasn't sure if this was a voting item or just something that we would get consensus on from the group. Like if there are some objections then let's go ahead and vet some of those out. Um, or, you know, I, I need well, to know at some point. I understand. I think we could, uh, if anybody has an objection they'd like to raise right now, we can entertain that. If not, I don't, I don't oppose what you've done here. I think that we could do that, and that would help you in your job, and it wouldn't be binding on, on anybody. So I think that's fine. Anybody have any objections to, to that tonight, or anybody want to raise an objection with Chris? Draft is dated yesterday, so I, I need at least a couple of days. I understand, but what he's talking about right now is just this list of substantive changes. So, but I think that's what we'll do. We'll just uh, we'll do it outside of this. Okay. okay. So we weren't. If there are no more questions for Chris. We will uh, move on. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, Mr. Barber. All right. Here's our first update since Thanksgiving. Since we did meet second meeting in December. Um, We'll start with Jim. Uh, he has had an opportunity to sit through a debrief of the Southwire cyber attack and has come back um, somewhat sobered by the impact on the company and has some ideas about things that we need to do differently. One of the things that he and Charles have worked on recently is trying to develop true redundancy at our off-site location pretty much in every respect. So one of the things that bit us was they had a power outage and we didn't have redundant power supply in the cabinet that we were operating out of. So those things are, have been addressed. I think we're getting closer to the point where he feels like we're really fully redundant. 
what would take us down now would be both power sources going out simultaneously. So, you know, we're still exposed somewhat. We've been working on City Hall. We had an issue, and if you've ever been in there and listened to Bobby while he was working on trying trying to pull up a PDF file or something, he'd be fussing about the response time. We've recabled most of the building, uh, and then Nick came in after that, and we redid a lot of the electrical supply. For instance, the ceiling fan in my office was powered from back in the room where the panel is with an extension cord, right, in the ceiling. So, I mean, and that's just a microcosm of the whole, how the whole building was wired. So Nick and the electrical crew have been working on that. Pine Mountain has just finished their busy season, which runs into September, into December. Ghost Train and the Christmas Winter Wonderland both set attendance records. They were worn out, though, I'm telling you, at the end of that. Um, another change, and we've talked about this, and I'm not sure how clearly this has gotten across, but we, we made a decision somewhere last year to move the Douglas inmate crew to Pine Mountain full-time 40 hours a week or whatever they're, you know, Tuesday to Friday, 10 hours a day. That's all they do is Pine Mountain now, and they've been doing that for months. We have literally removed dozens of trailers of junk from out there that accumulated over more than a decade. We have also begun the process of dismantling a lot of the fencing at the animal exhibit. So if you've listened to Wesley talk about having a garden out there and some other things, that's all related. I encourage you to go out there. If you haven't been out there since the summer of 18, I think you'll be shocked at how different it is. Um, the police department, again, we think, has no vacancies. Wow. So we have one, one um, candidate in the academy. We have four that have just gotten out of the academy that are in FTO. So we are literally a few months away from having a full complement all on the street. And I don't think that's happened since I've been here. Right? So we'll see how that goes. The downside is the wastewater plant. So in the last two months, we have lost four people at the West Plant. One moved back to Ohio, one moved back to California, one moved to LaGrange, and another one back, went back to, I think, his former employer. So we're not doing well. So we're doing well on one, not doing well on that one. So pretty soon, I think Pete and Charlene are going to be running the West Plant. So we'll see how that works. Uh, the Hickstown block sidewalk renovation is going to get started, we hope, Monday, weather permitting. We think we've got the permitting, the utility relocation, and all that out of the way. We're coordinating traffic control now with Jeremy and his guys. Uh, you probably have noticed on the trip to the post office that we got the striping done on Community Square. That looks nice, and uh, the county did a great job on that paving. If you've been out there and, and taken a look at it, driven during the day where you could see it, so that's very attractive. Um, Janet has talked about rural zone a couple of times, but she's beginning to reach out to people. You've had a meeting with the banks, and you've got another one coming up with restaurant down well, downtown owners. All right, so we're trying to get the word out on Rural Zone. Staff has been meeting to talk about the census and how we get the word out, how we're, what we're going to do, what we're not going to do, what costs too much, what doesn't. So for about, what would you say, Sarah, how long have we been working on neighborhoods? A year? Maybe. We're trying to get a neighborhood assigned to every location in the utility billing system. Even if they're not in the neighborhood, we're making up, you know, like a ge geographic designation. So we think we've just about gotten that done. And what we've determined is we have almost 100 
identified neighborhoods, neighborhoods that have names that we would recognize, and then probably another 30 areas where there wasn't historically a neighborhood name, you know, and so we've assigned it with something. So we got, we're working with about 125, 130 areas, and we're going to try to sign them. So we're going to try to put like a, like a, just a yard sign in the entrance to the neighborhood when we get to March 15th about the count and, you know, the website name. It's going to be pretty simple. We're going to use website and Facebook. We're not going to use robocall because of the expense, although we could call everybody, but we don't think it's worth the money. Um, we have some other things internally that we do. You know, the, the weekly report, we've got, you know, Ken putting things in the newspaper for us. Uh, we're going to have presentations in here for the next four weeks after tonight leading up to it. So, I mean, that's sort of where our head is right now. And if you want to add something, if you think, hey, you know, if you thought about doing this or that, you need, need to bring it up. Um, we have multiple projects underway that we've talked about. Seems like the whole time I've been here almost. Uh, one of them is the playground at Goldust. So the streets, street and grounds guys work together to do the site prep instead of us outsourcing it. And equipment installation is underway. They are doing the same kind of work at Butterballs. They've removed trees, uh, capped the water line, videoed the sewer line, removed the wall, and begun to excavate behind the uh, duplex to get that down to grade. The um, the grounds crew and the, the two Carroll inmate crews have been working a lot of the winter in the V-Plex area. We've painted bathrooms, we've pressure washed, we've replaced a lot of uh, rotten lumber in some of the structures. And then we took a shot at repairing the bank on the back of the Civic Center. If you've ever looked back there on the north side of the building, had a bad erosion and um, so we've filled that, and we filled it with the dirt from Butterballs, right? So we, that gave us a place for the dirt to go without having to, having to pay for it. Um, we used that dirt. We matted it, and so now we're waiting on that to grow back in. Uh, Bobby has been working with the pond company on the transportation study. We have put together a potential list of stakeholders. What that total, Bobby? You pay attention to that? So we gave Pond about 50 names, y'all, staff, and then probably 35 other people from the community for them to pick from as we get ready to get some feedback on, on the traffic study. Y'all really want to know about all the meetings we've had for two months? I mean, I can go through this, but... <coughs> You know, you know most of these. DDA had their annual Christmas dinner. We had um, the employee luncheon for Christmas. We we went up and met with Paulding County Water for the second time, trying to trying to generate some interest and in maybe water purchase there. Janet and I have met with Next Site for the first time. Uh, we have met with Arbor Valley, who wants to do the apartments on Anderson about the land swap, and we've talked to DDA about that. We're having that land appraised right now. Uh, the mayor and I have met two times about Thomas Dorsey. We met once with the foundation, and then we met this last Saturday with a consultant with the foundation. Uh, Sarah and I have met with the bank to talk about trying to improve our investment income. Um, and then a bunch of us went to the annual MLK service at Mount Prospect. And if you've never gone to that, I'd encourage you to do it. If you're like me and you grew up in a white Southern Baptist church, it's an experience, let me tell you. And the, and the speakers have been great. I've been three times now, and the speakers each year have been great. So I'd encourage you to do that. And for though there's several of us in the audience uh, that, were, that attended and I think can testify to that. Thank all of you all that. We really appreciate you being there. We're doing biometric screening um, this year, so a lot of our employees are involved in that, getting re ready for this year's uh, the beginning of wellness and how we do premium um, allocations. 
And then the last set of things would be water and sewer. So we're still working on multiple engineering projects that y'all have approved. The water treatment plant hopefully has not gone up more than last time. So it's still at $9 million is the estimate. Edge Road water line is still engineering. We started on North Avenue, sort of. Started engineering on North Avenue. We've, we've just about completed both of the borings. So Don Rich to Olive Tree under the railroad is about done or done. And then Pumpkin Town at 61, that water line relocation boring is about done. Uh, let's see here. And we, we have another idea in addition to Paulding County that we're chasing for raw water because that's one of our biggest long-term strategic objectives is to find additional raw water. And so Carter and Sloop is helping us with that, and I think we're meeting with them soon. So, <laughs> questions I, on any of that? Yeah, one question on, on the water. How about the uh, water line down 78 for the Leather Street houses? Uh, Carter and Sloop is still working on design on that, and you guys approved a contract with TRC to do the easement acquisition on that, and they're waiting on some kind of specific parcel information so Carter and Sloop's working on it TRC is going to do the easement and then we'll see what kind of cooperation we get from property owners all it right should be interesting do we have any um, or questions for the city manager on the city manager's report if not I think we have run through this agenda pretty well I would entertain a motion to adjourn motion to adjourn second I have a motion and a second. All in favor? You're adjourned. You're adjourned. Hey, Tom. Let's turn it. <laughs>